Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 92 of the Purple Hyacinth podcast, Rainy Birds. And today we have Foot and Neff. Hello. Hello. All right. Okay, this is crazy. Everyone brace yourself, get the tissues. <laughs> it's just awful. Okay, so we start out. Last time we know what happened. Our darling baby Kieran was about to be assaulted um, in the church. And we start out with a blurred out vision of um, Kieran's profile lying down on the floor. Then it focuses and gets more clear. And then his eyes open. <laughs> this is just awful. His beautiful blue eyes open. And he's staring up at the broken image of the, the ceiling of the church. Um, people pointed out there, looks like there's snowflakes falling down and that he was awoken by a snowflake. Oh, so sad. And then we have this image from afar, from a top, where humans is lying on the church ground. Everything's empty around him. And he looks awful. He is bloody. There's blood on the floor. He's stretched out. There have been people who pointed out parallels between when Kieran was on the floor and when Lauren was on the floor. Um, after episode 43, where she runs and she goes to the dra- training in her gym and she beats up the, bo- the punching bag and then she just collapses on the floor in, in like anger. So yes, his clothing is torn. It looks awful. We get a close up. He's still staring up. His chest is black and blue. His arms black and blue. There's, I mean, this was black and blue everywhere. Blood, uh, a little bit of blood on his face, but they did mostly leave it um, intact, as they said. Blood on the floor, blood on his hand, black and blue marks. Just, just awful. And the first on thing. His... Are... Yes, sorry, go on. Sorry, Mindy. I just wanted to say that on his right hand, there is no visible bruises. So they left his drawing hand good, as well as his face. Does it look like he's also wearing a glove? Maybe there's bruises under the glove. Yeah, it might be that. Uh, Poor baby Kieran. And he, the first thing he does, he starts laughing. He just laughs. And he laughs so hard that he, like, he puts his head back. And I'm like, why are you laughing? So my first thought is, Kieran is still undefeated. I was, I was a little bit happy to see this because his response is not to do, become despairing and hopeless and like a piece of mush. Um, he does still has this spark. He still has his personality, but then he says something, which you tell me what you think. I, I know there's differing opinions. He says, you didn't have to leave me alive. So I first thought when I read this, I was thinking, okay, this means he's like, oh, I wonder why they left me alive. Like what's, what was the reason? But other people interpreted it more pessimistically where they were thinking, oh, Kieran just doesn't want to live. And that's why he's saying that. What do you think he means by that? I think that the laughing wasn't like a spark. It wasn't done in spite. It was, I think sometimes, you know, sometimes you laugh uncomfortably and awkward situations it's kind of like that but I mean the situation isn't awkward it's more tragic and he's laughing not because it's funny but because it's what else can you do but laugh there's sometimes when you go past the pain when you go past that point it's no longer shocking it's just oh this again we're here and it's like a shock you're back here this is what is really going on in his life and here's yet another reminder so that even with the ups and downs we see with his and Lauren's relationships, this is the reality. This is how bad things are for him. So all you can do is laugh. And considering what he has to do, you know, when you're sitting there like that in pain and alone, I think that I have to go with the pessimistic route where, you know, why why would he want to be alive when that's what he has to wake up to? He woke up in the church alone, in cold, in rags. Mm-hmm. I definitely thought something similar. Um, I thought he was laughing because he couldn't believe what was happening. Like, he was just like, they still left me alive. Because like, you know, his line of how you didn't have to leave me alive, like, he could have just gone it over with, but you didn't. And he finds it a bit ridiculous that they haven't already. And I think he's just tired of it, honestly. Like he, 
he doesn't want to do this anymore and he would rather just you know die you didn't have to like you didn't have to like you weren't forced to or you didn't do it out of necessity they could have killed him but they didn't and I what I would say is that a not so small part of him wanted the other option I wonder if when he eventually fell asleep I don't think he fell asleep I think he was knocked out yeah he was totally Um. knocked unconscious he's just waking up (laughs) oh my god poor thing I think that he part of him maybe didn't expect to wake up because you know considering the state he was in Mm -hmm. it's hard to stay yeah because you laugh when you like you laugh in disbelief that is what I think he's doing right now that's also a great interpretation that like he's laughing because he can't believe he actually survived and again I I think part of him wishes that he didn't and I, there will be some people who say this is just getting into a side portion of shippers but like do I think there is anyone right now in Karen's life that he would uh stay alive for not really I think he would feel bad about leaving some people behind but then again he will he basically still has no one and I don't well, think he would really consider Lauren that close still especially after the events of 84 because I mean like he pieced out of there and then we haven't really seen him since that's debatable I mean you have a good point there but that's there's a portion of that that's debatable considering the blackmail material. Right. If that that's, was the situation, oh, then why would he be doing this if he had nothing to live for? I think there's what possible. Karen is staying oh, yeah. around, what I thought Karen was staying around for was that he wanted to do something good and by doing that good, he wanted to get rid of the Phantom Scythe. That is his main purpose if he died in the process. Um, it would be a bit of a nuisance but if he died afterwards he wouldn't really mind because once the well, phantom scythe is gone his problems are gone and I don't think he was really expecting to get attached to anyone else while he was trying to take down the phantom scythe so I think what I was guessing mainly was that you know after his phantom scythe is gone he was going to be gone too mm-hmm. because you know after the phantom scythe is gone he would basically have no more worries except the law <laughs> And he wouldn't want to suffer under Artella's law because that stuff is messy. So I think you just take what he perceives as the easier route. Yeah, I do think this seems like a, he was on a suicide mission. I think that, I think you're right. I think it makes sense that he's motivated enough by his revenge quest um, to stay alive. But like, yeah, like if he dies, he's like, well, oh well. <laughs> but mm-hmm. now, but enough what you said, what we, what the apostle, sorry, what the messenger said. A couple episodes ago where he's like you know why you didn't run so that to me does indicate that maybe the person they were blackmailing him with is still alive which i didn't think previously so we've yet to find out <laughs> i can the... feel the Dylan is a life theorist crawling out of the cave <laughs> 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 Sorry, now, go, you if, go. <laughs> the, um, if the bl- if whoever was if it was a living person being blackmailed and they were dead they wouldn't have anything to hold Kieran back anymore. I mean, they could always lie to him, but once he finds out, he's taking everything he learned and, you know, if not heading for the leader, at least take down some members. I'm sure it'd be possible, considering he does meet up with the messenger. I'm sure that he could find a way to at least get to one of the apostles through the messenger if he really, really mm-hmm. wanted to. I think- To expedite the process. I think Kieran sees his mission because he knows because Kieran knows that like there is a very high chance that he will not survive very long into his mission. I think what he wants to accomplish is to tear down as much of the Phantom Scythe as possible while leaving enough breadcrumbs for the people who come who come after him to finish off the job. So, by the way, also for gonna, yeah, I think so. Um, so speaking of his laughing, um, we, we talk about the man who laughs. So I'm not quite sure exactly who the man who laughs is, but if we're going to talk about Victor Hugo's novel, 
the man who laughs and if we're going to say kieran is that so in the man who laughs this should i give away the plot <laughs> i'm not going to not not the massive theory but just like the basic premise of the book um yeah i guess you'll find out soon enough. sure it's fine um, basically the main uh character his face has been disfigured by um uh, like this horrible group of people um in a, into a permanent laugh and they um and i'm not gonna tell you more about that because that gets into major plot but like that's the basic premise and um so you can kind of say kieran is forced to laugh all the time as a way of, of coping mechanism we know he does this all the time that's his like he puts on this flippant sarcastic attitude to cope with his life so that can be a parallel but anyway it doesn't relate to the massive theory which i'm totally not going to get into but oh dear. that's a small aspect <laughs> mm -hmm. anywho so this is tragic we it's super sad super awful now we get to the office um we open up with it's actually in the united states symbol <laughs> in our <laughs> palace but okay <laughs> And um, Herman is talking to a bunch of people and he says, one last thing, I wanna thank everyone who signed up for the security team at the Count Redcliffe's, uh, Redcliffe's ball on the 17th. And you have a bunch of people in the room. I forwarded the list to Lord Rimesel. It's so funny, forwarded, that's an email term, just pointing out. <laughs> and Lieutenant Hawks and Sergeant Liddell will hold this session for all volunteers soon to discuss preparation and coordination with other precincts. That is all for today, dismissed. And they're walking out and Lauren's thinking to herself, Dawkins was ready to order police presence with Phantom Scythe members among the guests and circus crew. So she remembers that the circus crew is that. And then she's like, is the entire circus can't be on the ball? Again, looking a little overwhelmed and just like, oh my God, more like things to contend with. And we still have to figure out what Flemings will be doing there with the others. And she says, I didn't join, thanks. I didn't join the security team because infiltrating the event the old fashioned way will reap better results, but they will be there too. And we have, um, Will and Kim. Now, Lauren is very smart in realizing that this is going to be an issue for her because it's one thing to fool people who don't know her. It's another thing to fool and hide with um, um, by the people who do know her very well. Mm -hmm. And we're... Um, I, guess, <laughs> I guess we can definitely expect some more loon-type antics coming up in this season. I was hoping that the ball would be this season and it seems to be set up for this season which is why we have, this is why we're not even at mid-season yet because they have a whole, you know, big party they have to do in this season, <laughs> which will probably, I would say the party's going to last as long or longer than the circus arc. You think that'll be set up closer to the, um, um, the finale or the mid-season finale? Oh, definitely finale. Because we're about, we're almost at the mid-season, so I definitely think it'll be like finale material. Mm -hmm. Giant yeah. explosion. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I know we shouldn't. I know we don't want Lauren and to fail, but that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> I can totally see them failing. Like I want them to. And Lauren and Karen literally watch the city burn. Like that is their darkest moment. Like, you know, or the darkest hour when you think of the hero's journey, there's or just, you know, plot and how you build a plot. There is a darkest hour at some point. And I think the ending of season two would be a good place to start off that darkest hour. Because then when you go into season three, you're like, oh God, oh no. But I think, I hope the I hope the ball isn't too soon because I think that we still need some more development with Kieran and Lauren. We need more development with Kim and Will, and I can definitely see Darcy and Bella, more particularly Darcy, being at that ball. And so I, I'm hoping for more development with both of those characters before we get to the ball, because um, the ball seems like it's going to be an event with a lot of character growth, but that character growth is gonna need some more like set up character development. Um, so I, I, I'd give it like a good 30 episodes or so before we get to the ball because when we think about season one all the big events of that season happened around the 40 episode mark like that's when we got to the climax around you know the infamous episode and then stuff slowly kind of trickled down so I would say that like you know starting around 
hold up I need to do some like math in my head okay around like episode 140 I'd say is when we get the ball if it's if the ball and the ball will be rolling by then and then you'll change your name on discord to you know Darcy Prophet again or whatever (laughs) ball profit (laughs) timing profit bot profit whatever (laughs) I don't know if it would be up to 140 I feel like it would be maybe a little bit earlier yeah I'm not sure what the calculations you were well, doing, like, I'd say it'll start around, sorry, I think it'll start around like 130 to 135 ish and go to like 140, 145 ish, like ep- in episodes. Like, huh. you know, when you think of like episode 100, something, whatever. Yeah. Does that make the sense? The plot has sure. really been ratcheting up though. So, yeah, I'm inclined to, to think that it would happen even sooner, but. You know, as long as it's done well and I'm up for whether like whatever's best, that would be the most fun. To yeah, see. I totally agree. We used um season one in the beginning of season two, like later season one in the beginning of season two, like most or most of season two, like so far, has been done pretty slowly. Like we had it was an app for a period of time for every like eight episodes, if you were like timing it chronologically if you're timing it right it would be every eight episodes per like in story day so that would take forever and then we all know that the the timeline is a little messed up in ph so it gets a little hazy in season two but basically um we've been definitely having more time jumps than we did in earlier the season so it does tell us that we are trying to get to certain dates However, I can see we do have some stuff in between the ball and that would be Sandman and whatever he's preparing right now. Because he said that he has something to release at the end of the month and that would be before the ball. So there's probably a super big plot point around that that a bunch of episodes will um, be covering and dedicated to before we're able to get to the ball. Speaking of Sandman, totally apropos of almost nothing. My um, family today I'm at my brother's house, for some reason, they put this song on called Mr. Sandman from 1958. Oh, by the Cordes? Like, yeah. Do you know that song? Oh, yeah. Mr. Sandman, bring me a dream. Make him the oh, yeah. I've ever seen. <laughs> I am <laughs> so Metallica. I never heard of that song. And I'm like, wait, Sandman, Sandman. Someone said Sandman. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. So Mr. Sandman is bringing her a dream. I don't know. But anywho. So speaking of dream or nightmare, we have um, Kieran walking along in the hallway and he's carrying his, he's pushing along his archive, this cart, and it's creaking, creaking. He looks super stiff. Lauren goes by and she's like, we haven't talked since that night. And if you'll notice, I mean, the first thing we see Kieran is wearing, he's like gotten something on his neck, which is like high up. It's like a turtleneck or something underneath his shirt. And um, she flashes back to when he says they're dead. She walks past him, he's wearing gloves. Um, and Lauren, you know, kind of like looks at him. She notices that he's sweating. And I'm gonna assume he's sweating out of pain because of the effort of like walking around after he just got thoroughly beat up um, and still having to walk. I can, I can just feel that like ache all over his body. So mm-hmm. she when, looks back at him, she again flashes back. Um, to Sandman when he says do you really think the purple hyacinth is leaving flowers next to his victims as a threat to the royals and she says no and this is just her thinking Kieran's a human being Kieran has a heart and that's what makes her go back after him and show concern for him and she says wait Mr. White (laughs) having to be formal sorry for bothering you I need to take a look at this some paperwork I left in your trolley earlier I think I forgot to sign something so that's the front you know in front of everybody and she looks at his hands and she's like gloves um, obviously we know why he's wearing gloves he says no problem officer so clear I feel like the way he's bending down is also like a little creaky do you feel that like it's stiff like he's not bending yeah. he's like bending from the waist 100 of... he looks so stiff mm-hmm. also there's one panel that people were joking about <laughs> oh never mind actually it's not relevant for here anyways sorry that was off topic for this what for this what I didn't even think about like how hard it would have been honestly I was confused by this but I was like I thought he was just sweating because he was like he didn't want someone to notice the bruises or 
or the effort that he was putting but him like just physically straining makes so much more sense he's also maybe also because of the gloves and the turtleneck might add to that as well yeah uh, poor dude and she lauren uses this opportunity to say we have to talk can we meet at your apartment tonight and without fail i mean no matter what kieran still has that he's like Ooh, look who's in a rush. Did you miss me already? I was waiting for the innuendo, but he didn't he didn't have any of that. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, this guy, he has, you know, a lot of fortitude and I wonder, a lot of inner strength. Sorry. Hmm? I was wondering about why Lauren chose to approach him and how she chose to approach him. And the way right now, when we look at the panels of well, it's from her point of view now with the gloves and we're seeing what she's seeing. And I found it interesting because, you know, you s- I wonder how she's rationalizing going to him if it was partially, I think it was only partially because she saw that he wasn't doing so well or, or just ab- acting abnormally, which one shows how perceptive she is. And two, it shows that she really is starting to open up a little bit more to him. But I, we've already seen before that she's still conflicted over what happened in 43. But I think, hmm? oh, sorry, sorry, you Don't go. keep going. Oh, no, I thought that like she wanted to talk about uh, some of the stuff she learned with Sandman, seeing how she did a uh, flashback to um, what Sandman said. And like, I believe the last time they interacted was 84. And so her suddenly, her last time interacting with her, my bad. Okay, sorry. For the last time she interacted with him, he told her something that was relevant to a dude that she saw. And I'm sorry, my brain can literally not think today. Anyways, God. Okay, so Lauren saw Sandman, and Sandman was relevant to the last thing Karen said to her. So I think she wants to talk to Kieran about the last thing he said to her now that she has more information about Sandman and some stuff Sandman said to her. Would you (laughs) say that? Hmm? I think also, you know, she just got off, she wants, she just stopped thinking about the ball. She's going to have to, she's thinking about infiltrating it. Pretty sure Mm -hmm. that they're going to do that together or at least talk about that together. I can, I think I made this prediction a while back, but I can see Loon coming back for the ball. Like, I can see um, one of the episodes ending of just Loon reuniting, and they're like, and it's like the last words is like, welcome back, Loon, or something similar along those lines. Of, like, I have some thoughts on that. I think like, Loon's back in business, baby. And then we, we get um, a parallel that sort of, we get a scene that parallels the ending of episode. Um, 14 which is when we were introduced to Loon um, in the flesh and so I can totally see them coming back for the ball and then again it ending in a failure I mean also there's those are all the nitroglycerin that nitroglycerin nitroglyceride that they haven't discovered yet that they're pretty sure is going to blow the whole city up and they like have to find before a certain date so they gotta go and they have to like frame Loon on somebody because as we see, you know, I mean, Lauren doesn't know, but yet, but like he's been beaten up over this. So like they have to get going on framing it, someone for Loon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, think... be... I'm sorry, sorry enough, you go. <laughs> I think just what you said, Mindy, that makes me really excited because of what we're going to see later in the episode. I think it, it brings up a lot of tension there. And when we get there, I'll, there's, I mean, obviously we'll see why, but it's, it's a lot that um, that we that the it's so that sophism and ephemeris can go forward with it. There's a lot of options and a lot of ways we can choose to predict what'll happen. And I personally have some thoughts about it because I really think you know with Soleil and Loon, and I think that there could be some really interesting symbolism there when they work together or if they work together. I already feel that they're kind of like they're working together again, whether or not they understand it, but they have worked together since, since the, they broke off the deal. So 
<laughs> push together one willingly. But anywho, yeah, so Lauren, you know, it's both practical stuff and the fact that she notices him looking discomfited. And she says, let's meet at your apartment. And he's, you know, jokes around. And, you know, she rolls her eyes as usual. He passes her the flap flap. And he says, she says, he says, I think it's preferable that no one sees you anywhere near my apartment for now, which is also very sad because, you know, we know he's doing it to protect her because he knows his apartment is under surveillance. And uh, it's just sad. But it's also nice that Kieran wants to protect her. So do you think that she's already in danger? Because why else? Like for how long have they yeah. known and he's um, there? It must have been a while. Nev, building off what you said earlier, because it relates to this, I can totally see um them already knowing that Kieran and Lauren are loon, and this is just sort of like a test for Kieran. And they're watching oh, what yeah. he's trying to do uh, by giving him the assignment. But I can also, but what I'm seeing from this is we're going to get Kieran and Loon or what, Kieran and Laura and try to fake the Loon deaths. Like they go through with it. They're what they do works. And however, they still get hunted down and they're like, what? How did you find us? They Loon faked their death. How did you know it was us? And then it's sort of revealed that like they always knew sort of. And that is some sort of plot twist. I think given the fact that they, you know, um, know where Kieran lives and the fact that they so quickly saw that Darcy visited Bella, pretty sure they already know. I'm, I'm, I like the idea of somebody protecting Lauren and Beth Fairy, which also wouldn't make sense with the loom, but anywho. I'm gonna find out. But I wonder if what I'm Sandra ducking. is saying <laughs> is completely true because the sniper there and I don't know. I, I wonder if it was a setup. I wonder if Salmon is, I mean, he wasn't lying. And maybe they're just using, maybe the random side is using what else they have on him to kind of pull one over on Lauren. So even if what, what he was saying wasn't a, wasn't a lie, it doesn't have, doesn't mean that it's the entire truth either. Or they, they're somehow using him as a pawn with him without him even knowing. Like they're like, okay, you give her the information and then she's just playing right into our hands in whatever fashion. Possibly, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, Karen and Lauren, they always, I think, especially Lauren, she thinks, or at least at the beginning of the series, she thought she had control over what was happening. But I, I would really not be surprised if she is literally being puppeted around right now. So... And, you know, because I'm pretty sure the leader has a, or maybe a seven, has like a bigger master plan. And it's going to be something that has been present throughout the entire series that we've never noticed. And I think when, it, when it's all revealed and when everything clicks, we're going to feel like fools for not noticing. <laughs> That's the best kind of mystery, the one that's hidden in plain sight all along. Mm -hmm. It's simultaneously the best and worst feeling you get of being <laughs> an analyst of Purple Hyacinth. Yeah. <laughs> you have to go theory. find a place to scream. <laughs> okay. <Bitter and theory. laughs> so um, Lucas sticks his head around the corner and he says, oh, he's in clear. Lieutenant Hawks is briefing us on the itinerary change. What are you doing? So Lauren tells him, let's meet at the cave after work then. And then she runs away. She's like, coming, Randall. Thanks for the file, Mr. White. Have a good day. Goes away. And Kieran is staring after her with furrowed brows. Uh, what do you think those furrowed brows mean, guys? Um, he, you know, the infamous episode. He doesn't want to go back to that because we've known for a while, or at least we've speculated that when they go back to that setting, when they go back to the cave, because it's been a season since they were last there. When they go back to the cave, you know, the trauma train is just going to come in and run over all of us. So there's going to be some flashbacks to the Infinite episode. I think, I think it's good, though. I think they have to talk about it. You yeah, know? they have to face it. Start around it forever. You have to talk about it. I think there's something that we overlooked here. And I think it's because of the way the panel is drawn. So 
the, the one before Karen is staring after Lauren. She says, coming, Randall. Thanks for the file, Mr. White. Have a good day. When was the last time she bothered to say that to him? Especially considering his situation and what she saw of the gloves and the high neck and everything and the sweat. Yeah, what, what does that mean? Like, what do you, if I were him and if I were trained and I noticed this from someone I had heard, if I were him, I would think that's such a very odd thing that maybe he's not hiding as well as he thought. Well, we have seen Lauren keep up formalities around activist Karen when there are others around and uh, we do see Lucas there. So I just thought it was like, but it's, know, she's trying to be polite. It's as and much formal. a show for Karen as it is for Lucas, I think. That's what Luke. I got from that last panel. Mm -hmm. I think it could be interpreted either way, but I, I like that interpretation. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. it has a lot for their interpersonal growth. So it's oh, a yeah, very definitely. subtle thing. I also think that besides for Kieran being concerned about going back to the cave and thinking back to the last thing that happened in the cave, I think he's also aware that Lauren, he won't be able to hide his injuries from Lauren there. I think it's going to be, I think it feels a little too personal for him and where he feels like I'm not going to be able to hide it from her. And that's hard for him. He, like Lauren also, he's also very self-reliant and to let somebody into your cave, into your, into the, the the walls that you've built up around you he he's built up walls as though he's invincible as though nothing gets at him as though he you know everything is a joke for him and you know he's strong he's powerful nothing can defeat him and for him to be vulnerable around Lauren and to admit that he has been wounded just shows a how powerless he is to admit just physical weakness that he's been injured and that he doesn't have control over his life I think that is something that was going to be difficult for him that he recognizes that is probably coming up if she comes to the cave. So I also think that's the reason for his mm -hmm. expression. And one of the last times they were in the cave together was when she was fixing up his wounds. So we might get some parallels to that as well. But Mindy, I adore your interpretation. That is, it hurts so much. <laughs> Um, I was hoping for a um, scene where finally Lauren is taking care of someone else and, you know, particularly Kieran, but I wonder if that does happen, how would that go through? Because would it be kind of a gateway? I can see it kind of being a gateway for them to become more comfortable with each other again, but Will it be enough to get rid of the effects of 43? Will they have another candid conversation next episode, maybe? I wonder how that'll also, go. I don't I think they'll have to have a conversation. If she discovers it, I think that he'll be forced to be honest mm -hmm. and and not just show like shove everything away and pretend that it's all okay. I mean, even if she doesn't discover it, I think they're gonna have to have a serious Heart to heart because of just the severity of their new location or of their old location because this place is a place with a lot of bad memories that can't really be unaddressed and can't stay unaddressed and they have sort of been skirting around the issue a bit as they've focused on you know more I guess to them relevant issues such as you know an upcoming bombing but yeah, they're going to have to address it at some point, and it would be good to do it soon before the ball. I, you know, I don't know why it didn't click yet, but now it really did just click. We're talking about the cave, and we're talking about episode 43, but I failed to put together in my mind that that's where it happened. No! <laughs> I was like, wait, that's doubly, that's doubly important that she's like let's go meet there <laughs> wait a second oh no and credit to lauren oh. you know lauren is so focused and she's willing to put aside the discomfort she probably has in order to get their mission done so mm -hmm. again that's our typical single-minded lauren <laughs> i mean karen's kind of the same right he's willing to put the mission over himself and that is not healthy kids <laughs> 
There's just like, um, so much more emotional no. for me. <laughs> I can imagine a Loki hug. That would satisfy the shippers. But yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they hug. So Not even for prepared. shippers. I feel like a little bit of like it was just as friends not as a yeah. ship just seeing people as friends as yeah I don't think it's gonna that. be romantic it's totally not gonna yeah. be romantic it's It'd way too early so for that much more beautiful you know it's, if they're I just think, yeah we can see Romance. them having a platonic hug sorry that's what I meant earlier but I can also see the shippers taking that hug and running with it <laughs> go for it I I, I would yeah. probably do the same <laughs> It's going to be the best time of Loki they get for a while. Honestly, you know, it's weird. As much as like I'm a crazy romantic, like for me, all I hope for out of them is intimacy because to me, that's the basis of both friendship and romance. And that's what they need, both of them. They need to let someone close to their heart, whether it's romance is maybe just like a step further or like a very, very intense friendship, but they need to be close to somebody. They need to have that love in their life. And whether it's romance or just very close mm-hmm. friendship, I'm, I'm fine with either, yeah. you know, believe it or not. Indeed. This is just like, okay, this is a personal preference of mine, but like, I literally cannot do the romance genre. For me, romance always has to come as like a subplot because I don't know, I in romance a lot, for me, it feels like we skip the friendship step and the friendship step is just so important in an actual it's relationship. It's the whole relationship. Mm-hmm. And so a it's... lot of times I feel like in romance, they skip it and they just go straight to the sexual tension. <laughs> but I'm like, where is the romance? Where is the in- Where is the platonic intimacy? Key word there, platonic. It's, it's missing like you need- the meat of it. Mm-hmm. You need to, for I think in a good romance, um, you need to understand one another and that understanding can't come from a place of romance because I'd say because I'm a bit um of a pessimist that romance does make you a little blind it does uh make you (laughs) cherry pick some of the things that you experience or you feel and the world is just in pink for you (laughs) so I think that you know in a good romance there has to be good friendship first because, you know, with a friendship, I'd say can even get more raw than a romance, even though, and I guess, and I think friendships are just so underrated in general. Ooh, I'm like, your words times a million. I've been married like 11 years and I had the classic like falling in love story with my husband, like beyond the chemical high. I was 20, so perfect age. I was like super idealistic and very emotional. So yeah, I had like the biggest high meeting my husband, like falling in love and like, you know, my family didn't want me to marry him, I'm gonna marry him anyway, blah, 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 so whole thing. And then, um, you know, through many, many ups and downs later, at the end of the day, I feel like my husband is my best friend. And, you know, even if like, God forbid, something would happen to our bodies and let's say I would have no sexual drive left, I would still be his best friend. You know, we, we enjoy each other mm-hmm. for our brains, for our personalities, for our, what we think about, for what we enjoy. So um, yes, I'm a very big fan of the friendship thing. Yeah, if you're going to spend like, you know, a good portion of your life with someone, you're going to want to be friends with them because <laughs> it would be very messy if you were not and you guys did not actually enjoy each other's company. <laughs> well said. Uh-huh. Go on, sorry. Oh, I just said well said because I really can't add anything that was really well said. Thank you. But yeah, that's um, why that's why I adore Platonic Loki because they are simply on another level. Like I think episodes like 15 and 16 are some of my favorite in the series because of their banter. It is just amazing. But they're not honest with each other at that point. Well, that's incredible. They're still that's what caused them to be so flimsy. Cuz mm-hmm, it was Kieran was still wearing a mask. Lauren is Lauren. <laughs> mm-hmm. Or she's not dishonest. She's very straightforward. She's always, she always has been. But and I, I hesitate to call her paranoid and distressing because she's not. Those words are too extreme. But she's Lauren. Mm-hmm. And it was the bridge. Like in the 30s, we saw her start to open up and Kieran start to open up too. But because their relationship was formed with such a flimsy base and no real understanding of who they were, who they are, and what they 
need from each other and what and such strict rules about how the relationship has to move forward while working as Loon. That's why 43 was so hard. Because it's not, mm -hmm. it's, it goes beyond the physical action of what happened, because that in itself, that in itself, bottom, but no excuse for that. But what makes it so much worse was the fact that their relationship was bad to begin with, even if it was glossed over with humor. They never had a good relationship. That is, that is so true, because like, Episode 43 is what needed to happen for the relationship to actually develop. Yes, we did see them grow closer. Yes, like they were getting a little more intimate and they were, they had a, what we would call a genuine friendship. They did, as you said, they were hiding behind, you know, quite a few masks. And so if we wanted to see the relationship have some genuine development and for them to actually move forward and grow as people themselves, Episode 43 did have to happen. It was inevitable. It was basically the only option for the relationship. Kind of like we a had... hard reset. Mm -hmm. yeah, and and like because I think also reason. for the readers, episode 43 was pretty good for the readers and Lauren because it really reminded us who exactly we were dealing with in the world of PH. And um episode 43 and then episode 91 I think do very good jobs of showing us exactly what is going on here and reminding us like these are the stakes these are the people that we should not be getting close to and all that we we're still getting close to Karen because the story has made him out to be um sympathetic but it reminds you like be careful with who you're with what you're dealing with here because um it's not very you know glittery and rain it's not glitters and rainbows mm -hmm. and I think you know it's I think it's super important because it's the central tension between Lauren and Kieran Kieran with his self-identification as a monster and his guilt at what he does and who he is and Lauren with you know I'm teaming up with the devil so you know that that is their major blockage and obstacle so definitely has to be said Anywho, which one of you wants to start the next segment with our darling Soleil? Um, I have no preference. Can I think I would like to do the last part. So okay, I can do it. So we transition with this one scene setting panel, and we see bamboo and um, uh, I'm not very well versed in my Asian <laughs> architecture, so I'm just going to say Asian architecture. Um, <laughs> we see some Asian style architecture. It's probably either Chinese or Japanese. I don't really remember uh, what the Carmine Camellia was. And that sort of take, that sets family. us up that we're no longer in the APD building. Uh, we're somewhere else. And for the people who remember, they'll recognize that we are at the Carmine Camellia, which did have uh, a lot of Asian accents and things in its architecture and style. So we started off with Will saying, Liddell, why are we here? We, should, we shouldn't be investigating employees at the Carmine Camellia. And they're walking outside of the wall. And then Kim says, huh, that weird lady swore she saw Loon here, but no one was able to confirm. Will is very exasperated and he's like, we don't have time for this. We should be looking into security protocols for the ball. And Kim says, I know what we have to do. Meet me at Rosalind's cafe in an hour. Alonzi. That's, not how, that's probably not how you pronounce it in French. Uh, my French teacher is very disappointed in me. And then Will says, God. Yeah. <laughs> I did learn French. I'm so tired of her. <laughs> I think Alon Alonzi, Alonzi is like... Um, Let's go or some, something like that. And it's in the conjugation is the conjugation for we in French. So it's like, uh, let, like us, let's go. And so the, uh, does, do we have any thoughts on that part? I wonder why they left so fast. Mm-hmm. Why did, why did they, so I'm assuming they were already at Carmine Camellia and 
after they went around and Kim was doing some thinking and Will was just there. Because... Is this the same day as... Um, what was episode 90? Okay. Yeah. As the beginning? 90? I think this, no, I think, I think this is a different day from when uh, Kim last talked to Lady A. Yeah, I think so. It's not the same not. day as the earlier part of the episode? Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't remember the timeline, but it is. Uh, they are in different outfits, so it is um, plausible to suggest it is um, that they are undercover right now, since they're not in APD uniforms. Or undercover, so, maybe they're just out of uniform. Yeah, this could be them off work as well. Maybe like, because these outfits do look like something they would wear, not something like you know that's APD issued as a disguise. Because, you know, Kim's a bit more really scrappy than though. Will, and Will has the, like, nice button-up and coat and shirt and a tie. <laughs> also has a tie, though, but, like, you know, her outfit Very in general dressy. more scrappy. <laughs> like, their dress-down outfits are, like, just stunning. <laughs> like, I would kill outfits. for Kim's pants, honestly. <laughs> I would kill for it. all the characters in PHs. I would, I would kill for their closets. <laughs> 100%. Mm-hmm. I'll show you this, this outfit that I put together that's very similar to their stuff yeah, I dressed up as a couple years ago I have an outfit that's kind of similar to something Lauren would wear <laughs> anyways an hour later um, we have Kim in the sunglasses she's wearing a hat that's very reminiscent of something Sherlock Holmes would wear and she's reading a newspaper um, we see a tea kettle go off and someone open the door and we're treated with a nice cafe scene or setting uh, the lighting is just gorgeous and then we get this beautiful panel of will the lighting is very reminiscent of the episode 85 lighting so soph is definitely trying out some new lighting styles right now and i am 100 percent here for it and living for it right now i'm thriving on this art he really does look beautiful <laughs> Mm-hmm. And I think also what makes him more beautiful is not just like the way that he's illustrated, but it's the strength of character he possesses. His face is very grim and set and he looks determined. And I think that's always very attractive when we see somebody with strength of character, with a backbone, with personality. That's very attractive. So I think that enhances that. Mm-hmm. He's definitely um, pretty stoic in that. And that is a very will trait of him, you know, stoicism. So. He looks very well right now. <laughs> he reminds me of a dad also. Very stern. Also, that is some half light, half dark lighting right now. Uh, <laughs> so mm-hmm. that could be some symbolism. <laughs> but, you know, the sun, the light is shining on him. So that kind it's of... Considering the lack into... of other colors, I would, is, I would say that it's more the sun. But mm-hmm. it was, like I mentioned before, I mean, there was even teal before, but, you know... Um, reds or blues mayhaps yeah but because there's such an abundance of sun it kind of cues us into like hey this is a soleil scene get ready it's been a hot second (laughs) because like last time we saw them we had that little moment in like what episode 90 uh so yeah we had a little moment and then last time we actually saw soleil doing investigative work was like episode 52 and that was a while back (laughs) So, uh, Will is walking towards what we assume to be Kim. She's at the back of the store. And he says, Liddell, are you smoking? And <laughs> Kim says, yes, I'm smoking hot. And then she says, no, this is a spe- <laughs> this is Special Agent White Swan. And on the newspaper, it seems like there are some hotels and travel ads right there. So that might be, you know, if we get to see the gang go overseas i would personally love to see them figure out where the bombs came from because that is a mystery i'm dying to know because there's this very popular theory i think i mentioned it here it's not super popular but i adore the theory that uh there's another government trying to take over our tellers so anyways yeah uh kim is smoking bad kim smoking is not good for you (laughs) and my spotify lately has just been plagued with like little lungs ads and so kim 
you need my Spotify right now. Pit smoking is not good for you. Anyways, we get this panel that says it's like a stamp on it and it says special agent white swan and it's very reminiscent of when you think of sort of a true crime movie or or not true crime but like a crime movie or like a mystery detective no uh, movie yeah no r and yeah the, the whole <laughs> graphics also is is made to look like like dramatic mm-hmm. you know, special agent white swan <laughs> Mm-hmm. And it's beautiful I love this I love this detail so much it just it fits so well especially with like you know the whole vibes of Soleil this is their thing if I could like sum up Soleil in one or one two panels it would be these panels of them like this um so she takes Will's hat and she says and you your code name is Raven Black and then we have the same type of panel for Will and Will is just he's speechless he's so done and i would like to say in the hour that these two were apart kim had a outfits change she literally delayed their investigation so she could change clothes and i just i respect and admire that i think she got will his hat also i don't think he walked in with a hat Mm -hmm. (laughs) i think she just dumped it on him oh yeah i think she gave will the hat my bad anyways um so will sits uh, back to back with her at a different table and he says okay what is this yeah by the way this whole thing her her dressing up and the outfit and whatever it's like basically totally unnecessary because uh, like sitting at different tables i mean they just talk this whole episode they just talk like it was totally not necessary for that for her to go all theatrical but obviously in kim's mind it was necessary mm-hmm. <laughs> kim is doing what she thinks is necessary to solve the mystery <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, dressing up is a crucial part of it. I may be looking into it too much, but I find that so strange, considering out of the four main characters, you have Kim, who is arguably more, has, you know, she she talks about Lauren's deductive abilities, but Kim's deductive abilities are actually superior. At least it very much seems like it. And when you have that compared with how she chooses to go along with these investigations, it really makes you wonder why. If it's more than, I don't know, like it, it, while this is comedic and it does fit her comedic personality, what progress are they actually making when they do this? I mean, they made a lot of progress by, by the end of the episode. Yeah, by the end of it, which is, I think thoughts. <laughs> in Kim's mind, I think episode 77 shows a lot about her. Um, So Kim understands the gravity and the severity of the situation. She understands what the world is like right now in our tallest and what what her duty as a police officer is to the city uh, while facing the Phantom Scythe. And well, yeah, it's... um, her behavior seems pretty immature and childish I think she's doing this to bring some sort of brightness to her life because you know everything's pretty depressing so she's just trying to make light in a dark situation yeah it could be her philosophy of you know this the smile in the snow and it also makes me wonder why she's smoking (laughs) Oh, she's smoking because it makes her feel professional. <laughs> she's she's not doing it because she's not doing all this because it's effective to her mission. She's doing it because it's just what she likes to do. And you know, when faced with something so, um, you know, I guess serious, uh, people do uh, have their coping mechanisms, and I think Kim's coping mechanism in this is sort of a bit of comedy and keeping things lighthearted it's how she deals with such serious issues and you know saying what she said at the end of the episode saying lauren is loon that is a pretty heavy accusation and it's probably even weighing down on her a bit and so she's trying to make herself feel comfortable in 
in an environment that she is soon going to make very uncomfortable. I think that, I think that's an excellent read. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if, um, based off of what you were saying, that her smoking also reflects, you know, Kim does what she, whatever she wants, really, as long as other things, as long as the important things get done, but anything, any little thing to make investigation more fun or less draining. I mean, it's also, while Will acts annoyed, we've seen that he really does appreciate these efforts. I wonder if smoking for her is just another thing that she does just to um, make things a little easier without really caring about the consequences. It's just make things okay well, for as long as possible. Well, no, it, um, she, in the episode, I think a bit, a few panels later on, she's like, oh, I hate smoking so much. She like keeps coughing and because like she's not used to it. So I don't think that she turns to smoking as a coping mechanism. I think she's just trying to emulate uh, a detective. And, you know, we all have like, you know, a stereotypical detective. We think of like, you know, Sherlock mm -hmm. Holmes, and Watson. Um, she's trying to emulate that sort of... Uh, character and so when we see him smoking and we, when we see her in the sunglasses when we see her uh in the hat she's giving off like you know the sherlock sort of bondish vibes um i think she's trying rather than turning to smoking she's just trying to emulate a character mm -hmm. yeah i probably look too close to it but you're i think you're right um so yeah Kim says, first with Trevor, Onslow, Blakesley, and Colden, killed by the Purple Hyacinth. Four people with four different backgrounds. And then their stake, murdered by the same assassin as Harvey, soon after the night the weird lady supposedly saw a loon at the Carmen. Um, we got a flashback to when Kim and Will were at the Carmine, so it's assumed that the scene we saw earlier was them leaving it. Oh, yeah, yeah. And Kim says, December 26th, hmm, only Ryan Fleming's had a reservation for 11 p.m. That's when the weird lady was there. And we see this attendant say, yes, it was a room for four. Peculiar guests, we were not told, we were told not to enter. Uh, and then the flashback ends, and just Thinking about it, it means that we know that there were actually five guests at, in that room, but this lady said it was four. So it is assumed that the messenger was a secret attendant who was that or attendee who is like not supposed to be known at all. Because when you think of like the four people who are more likely to be at risk being seen there, like there's less stakes that they're seen there. It's Fleming's stake. Elvira, is that her name? I think it's her name. Elvira and Bella, but like the messenger is the fifth person. So it's weird mm -hmm. that she said four. There's also the possibility that she's lying, but I think you're right. I don't I don't think she's lying. Not many um but it also makes me wonder if the Carmen has actually really does have connections to the phantom side or if it was just a place they used as a cover just to go somewhere to talk oh that's weird because there was an attendant who was in the room i think at one point oh wasn't there i think there was a attendant but i don't remember if she was in there before or after the messenger arrived because it would be not smart of the ps to have an attendant there um while a messenger was there like if they if the Carmine wasn't associated with the PS. But I think in one of the episodes, maybe it was 65, Kieran does call the Carmine a uh, part of the PS underground. So maybe. Hmm. But, uh, if the attendant, basically, if the attendant was there while the messenger was there, like in one of the Carmine episodes, then this lady is probably lying. <laughs> Uh, Neff, tell me when you want to switch over to your narration. So Kim um, says... I'm sorry, keep going. Um, 
The patchwork ends and Kim says, if the weird lady was actually right and the staff were forbidden to enter the only other room occupied at the time, we should look into this Ryan Flemings because it sounds, she takes, and she takes her cigar out and blows out some smoke, suspicious. Then she coughs into her newspaper and there's a lot of smoke coming from it. (laughs) And she's just coughing and she's like, and she's thinking to herself, I can't smoke. This was a terrible decision. I can take it from around here if you'd like. Yep, you can go. Okay. Um, now Will's speaking and he says, I've seen his name before. He's a banker, if I recall correctly. I'm not sure what the... I like that we get a very clear look at the um, newspaper, but I'm, well, I didn't look into the translations, mm-hmm. so I'm not quite sure. Um, that could be interesting, though, because it's really a lot more clear than the newspapers we usually see. There's an elephant that wouldn't be surprised if it's or the Circus Royale. Or just, yeah. you know, random stock that uh, so was able to get on, like, CSP or um, Ketchup. I don't think there's much in them. I think it's just random. Yeah, maybe. Like, wow. Mm-hmm. There have been some times where, like, the files and what um, was said in the files was pretty important. Uh, we have seen the newspaper used as a plot point before, but I'm not sure how important these newspapers are. Mm-hmm. I think there's an ad for biscuits. Yeah. <laughs> just look that up. Yeah, it's like just regular ads. Mm-hmm. Anyway, sorry, nephew. Uh, you can okay. continue. <laughs> okay, so Will says but we don't have the slightest idea who the others were. And nothing guarantees that woman didn't confuse the security guys for Loon. Something must have been going on. And in this panel, Kim is putting out the cigar. <laughs> um, the waitress comes over and says, would you like to order anything, ma'am? And Lauren interrupts her and jumps out of her chair and says dramatically, Oh, Lauren, goddess of deduction, lend thy powers to my humble mortal self. Which freaks out um, the waitress and peeps Kim, uh, Will out. (laughs) And the waitress stands there smiling uncomfortably. (laughs) Kim slams her fist down on the table and says, it's not working, Lauren has abandoned me. Will says, you know, you can just give her a phone call at this point. But Kim turns to the waitress and says, yes, miss, I would like to order a hammer to knock me out of this cruel world. I think something that's very important here is that because Kim suspects Lauren as Loon, she's not going to want to give Lauren a phone call to ask about these things. <laughs> now that now that Kim believes that Lauren is Loon and probably basically knows it, she's not going to want to ask Lauren for help with such things because Lauren's just going to try and shut it down to protect her own identity. Which kind of puts more power when Kim said Lauren has abandoned me. Maybe it's not so much of a joke. Mm -hmm. She's done something so important and not told her. Not this foreshadowing. (laughs) Honestly, even Lauren fake dating Kieran, like, saying oh yes I'm dating Kieran and not telling Kim I mean if my friend my close friend was dating someone they didn't tell me I would be so mad so yeah Uh, I'd probably understand it it can be (laughs) private (laughs) but it is weird because Kim or sorry Lauren was genuinely pretty is or it seemed like Lauren was pretty open with Kim about uh, her love interest especially since you know Kim helped out with Evans so (laughs) and Kim seems to know about all the terrible dates This poor waitress. <laughs> yeah, she's trying to do her job. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, Kim's so dramatic. It's so funny. There's like tears streaming out of her face. <laughs> <laughs> the next line she says, uh, Nap is all right if I say it. Um, the cruel hammer thing? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I said that. Oh, I cannot remember. <laughs> Anyways, okay. the line of like, I would like to order a hammer 
to knock me out of this cruel world is just so relatable. This is like the reason, like top 10 reasons why Kim is the best character in this comedy. <laughs> She's so clever. She says the funniest things. Mm-hmm. Kim is here to vibe and get stuff done while she is vibing. And I, I love that for her. <laughs> Um, Will says, haha, don't mind her, miss. Two cups of tea, please. And the waitress goes to the phone and says, hello, police, I'd like to report. And Will interrupts her, saying, we are the cops. <laughs> and another character who we've seen before turns around, hey, could you keep it down? And Kim says, oh my, is that you, Mr. Evans? So you came here with your wife this time? And the woman sitting across from Mr. Evans, much very similar to something we've seen before, stands up and says, you have a wife? <laughs> Kim looking, not, not exactly surprised, but also, I'm not sure what the word is for that. She says, oh, that isn't his wife. Anyways, Black Raven, you know what's curious? Sig was killed at the circus right behind the artist's tents of all places. Didn't seem like the type to go to circus shows for fun. I'm not sure how, the, how that connects with everything else, but there's something weird. And in the background of this panel, we see the woman Mr. Evans is on a date with pouring a jug of water over his head. I love this woman so much. <laughs> is this, by the way, the same cafe that Lauren was dated him in? Does he just like take women to the same cafe? I don't think I, so. I think it's a different no. cafe. I was wondering, actually. The layout. the layout is a bit different, so I think it's a different cafe. Maybe. I don't I'm not going to say which current day politician he reminds me of, but anyway. <laughs> you know. Oh, Mindy. <laughs> um, I would like to say, like, uh, Kim saying, like, how Sig didn't, didn't seem like the type to go to circus shows are fun. I'm not sure how that connects with everything else, but there's something weird. Kim is basically catching up on everything Lauren knows. She's just, you know, a bit behind because she's not doing the loon missions, but she basically knows almost everything that Lori does like she knows about she knows that like the loon convicts were up to something fishy um she knows that the pantheon might be involved with the phantom scythe like <laughs> damn him that is seriously impressive and as a fellow theorist i respect the skills <laughs> yeah me too i was like whoa can't believe she's getting it all but it makes sense. Like the puzzle pieces are all there for her. So I'm glad she's noticing because I would be so frustrated if she didn't. But I'm really scared for how Will is going to react now. Mm -hmm. uh, so at this point, Will is speaking and he says, what, that Lauren is at the circus too? Yes, that. And that the Circus Royale's next big gig is the reception for Red Cliff's Ball. I would like to also point out that in this scene, the Evans situation is still going on and he's covered in water, reaching out for the woman who's st storming out of the cafe. <laughs> oh, and he gets the door slammed in his face. Door, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Will says, hmm, okay, and? Kim says, and she's suddenly a lot more serious. And you don't think it's weird that Lauren didn't sign up for that? That surprised me too, but knowing Herman was reviewing the candidatures, maybe she thought she'd get rejected anyways. Kim says it's not really like her. She's been trying so hard to redeem herself for some sake. I'm worried for her, you know, Tim's sake. And now we're in a flashback where, um, I, don't, I don't remember which episode it was, but it was the one where Lauren snuck in through the patio and, sorry, the balcony, and they're talking. Which one? 66, I believe. Mm -hmm. So they're in Lauren's office and she says, Tim's sake, he's back in town. I know it was wrong of me to follow him, but could I really just ignore him after all he's done? 
could you please keep this between us? And now we have Kim's beautiful quote, absolute gold. Cross my heart and hope to die. You're giving me anxiety, but I'll comply. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And now we see Kim. This is actually a really incredible drawing of her. She's just so beautiful. Um, I, I wonder if her eyes look really gold in this, and I wonder if that's kind of in reference to Lauren and her ability. She's golden eyes and you know, deduction and all that, and Kim being good at that too, minus the abilities. Um, she has hazel eyes, so I don't know. It might yeah. be some lighting since the lighting's pretty yellow. True, but I still think it'd be fun, you know? Why not? Yeah, um, but honestly, hmm? I'd be kind of sad if it was, like, because Kim sort of idolizes Lauren. It seems like she sees her as the goddess of the deduction, and Kim doesn't see herself as great to Lauren when it comes to that sort of stuff. But Kim is really proving herself to be an amazing detective. And so just, I feel bad for Kim because we're seeing her and she sees herself as well in Lauren's shadow. That's actually a good point. I wonder if... No, I think I think you're right. I don't I don't think it would come I don't think it would ever um manifest itself as a place of contention for Kim. And I hope yeah. it doesn't. Because but it I can make see it makes sense for a character. Mm -hmm. I can see Kim being kind of like realizing at one point and being a little sad because she sort of just lives in the shadow of Lauren like in both the story and to the audience as the readers like Lauren is a way more popular character and who gets a lot more attention and well yes Lauren is like the main main character of this story I do think that um Kim does get pretty underrated sometimes and it does seem like you know maybe if Dana was a police officer that Kim might be living in the shadow of Dana as well yeah that's a really good point and that would bring another parallel between both her and Will. They're living in the shadows of their siblings and the people that they look up to. I don't really know who Will looks up to, but like he's still living in he quite a few shadows. He used to look up to Raphael. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Lauren is probably like another sibling figure for Kim. I wouldn't be surprised if she like, saw Lauren as a sister figure. And, you know, if... Darcy comes into the plot more I don't think him is going to hate Darcy for this because she's not the type of person she knows that like whatever is happening between Darcy and Will it's neither of their fault but I do think that Kim will also be living in Darcy's shadow as well sometime soon but you know Kim doesn't re I think I don't see Kim resenting the people or uh, who are casting the shadows that she's in but I think it, it will be kind of hard her. for her. I can't see Kim resenting them because like she knows it's not really their fault that she's in their shadows. It's just, you know, a matter of circumstance. It's not even that she's in their shadows per se. It's it's she she she's holding her own. She's more than capable of holding her own. It's just that I mean so compared to the way things are. Kim has a higher stance than Lauren right now. She has more trust. I mean, Herman obviously trusts and treats Kim better than Lauren. Lauren was demoted. It's, I think Kim, what you said is true, but at the same time, Kim is comfortable enough in herself that she doesn't have anything to prove per se. It's not a part mm -hmm. of her character to need to prove. Maybe this is, We're Maybe it's not something she just thinks about. Kim is yeah, definitely well, confident think... in herself and her abilities, but I do still think that she's underestimating herself a bit by the way that she was calling herself like a mere mortal compared to Lauren, the goddess, the goddess of deduction. And because we're not, because it is confirmed that we're not really getting much of Kim's backstory this season, it's going to come more in season three. I would say that uh, any more eccentric like Kim conflicts 
and more complex to him as a character and herself will probably come more in season three so season two is probably just manifesting these issues and setting up these conflicts i wonder if it's also um another way to look at it would be sometimes people who this is just something i've noticed i'm not sure what the word for it is so i'm just going to crudely describe this that this behavior that people do where you know you know something and Kim Kim knows that she has really good deductive abilities. She's proven herself, she has high standing, and it she knows that she is capable of putting these things together. If not, if she was doubting herself, she wouldn't be so soon bringing up what she thinks is going on. She sometimes people well, one, it could be a tactic to just keep Lauren in the center, slowly introduce the fact that Lauren is a big point of what she's talking about here, that Lauren is already on her mind. It could be partially to um, ease Will into what she's about to say, but also to keep us readers in the loop too, that Lauren is going to be coming up soon. Lauren is related to this. Lauren is a big part of everything that's going on, more than Lauren knows. So, sometimes when people who know that they're very good at certain things they will it's kind of like it's not being humble isn't the right word for it but it's kind of humbly putting themselves down and raising other people up and saying those overly dramatic things and Kim is very clever so she's not she doesn't need to prove anything she already is there so I feel like by putting Lauren above her in that way, it's less of a confidence thing and more of just a way to be easygoing and not bring too much attention to the gravity of what she's doing or what's going on in her mind. Because what's going on is very hardcore, very fast, and she has confidence enough to bring it up so soon after she said that. So it obviously, I think, refers to something more than just her putting herself down. Yeah, I, I think I think that her statements come from a place of actually very high confidence in herself. The fact that she's comfortable in praising other people. Some people who have low self-esteem can't praise other people. So I think that she actually has a lot of self-esteem. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I, I agree. But um, I think I think Kim is comfortable playing more of a supporting role. But I do think that she is, or she is getting overlooked quite a bit. Because Kim is a very competent person, and I don't think the fandom really realizes that that much. And she oh, is. We do. This episode we haven't seen. Away. <laughs> we haven't seen enough. Like, every time we've seen her, we've seen that she's capable of it. But we need to see her in action because she's taken a passive role so far compared to Lauren and Kieran. Once it's put into action, once we see in a situation that is more, there's more stakes, and look, this is very high stakes, but more stakes in the moment, that makes sense. Then I feel like the fandom will really, yeah. She's very, she also, in a way, she loves to goof around, right? So she doesn't take a lot of things seriously and doesn't apply herself and show, you know, we've seen when she did apply herself, which is when it comes to target shooting, then she is like, oh, you know, um, blows everyone away. But most of the time, she, she seems content to just be a goofball. I think she does take stuff seriously. She just uses humor as a way to cope with the severity. So in this scene now, um, with the panel of Kim looking less, uh, much more serious. Um, after Sake's murder and the news leads from Chow's case, I wouldn't be surprised if she tried to investigate that circus further, which is pretty apt observation. But I don't think we've seen that yet from Lauren, but so it's a good predictor. Getting, hmm? We're probably getting more Soleil episodes coming soon. Good. Looking forward to that. <laughs> well said in countering what Kim just said, but wouldn't the security team be the perfect cover if that's what she wanted? Kim said, well, exactly, which is why. And she cuts off there. I suppose you could say that's her 
it's it could be a little bit of confidence shaken or really bringing out once you once you bring it out it's out there you can't take those words back it's a very real thing so i think that's why she cut off there a bit um because yeah. he's gonna be totally off guard and i wonder if will realizes it too because we've seen him looking out the window and seeing some things and he's not dumb by any means and i'm sure he's a little suspicious too um kim says you know what i mean i think lauren is loon and we had a really interesting reaction there from will mm -hmm. and that is that so, instead of focusing on the whole kim knows i want to talk about the you know what i mean line because i was thinking this as you were reading it i think will knows lauren is loon he's just in a state of denial because every time Kim tries to suggest something, he kind of counter arguments it. Yeah. Um, Cause there that's... was one scene uh, where Kim, and when we go to the line where it's like, don't you think it was weird that Lauren didn't sign up for the party or the ball? Will tries to justify it by saying, but you know, Herman, she knew Herman was reviewing the signups and you know, maybe she just thought she was going to get rejected anyways. He is, trying to I think he's just trying to explain uh, Lauren's behavior without considering the worst possibility which I guess for him would be that Lauren is loon because and I would say I say the worst possibility the worst um, situation for him is Lauren is loon because his dad wants him to find loon and I think he's still under that pressure from his dad and he hasn't broken out of it yet so he still wants to do what his dad wants, which means, and if Lauren is loon, then he's going to bust his childhood friend. And as we see from the episode 87, Lauren is like the only person who's consistently been there for him his entire life. Like since they were kids, he doesn't want to um, betray her in that sense. Considering what we found out of Raphael and how recent it was, I think that finding out his childhood friend is also caught up in something would be an immense shock, especially in such short time spans of each other. That would shake up anyone. He'd be doubting everything. And I feel like, I, I wonder if, I've, I've, I kind of theorized that Will at first wouldn't react well. He's He, he lives under the expectations of other people. He's very much his own person, but at the same time, he's not thriving. He's not being truly himself while under his father's thumb and his expectations. So when he sees the people around him doing stuff like finding out that they're not who they think they who they who they who he thought they were, he I feel like his reaction would be to maybe go against, maybe to go back where it's familiar, even if it's not healthy, and go after Loon. While Kim, on the other hand, I really, I don't think that she's going, I mean, we saw what she did with the coat. At the, I think it was at the Golden Clover. She got rid of evidence. So I wonder if Will is going to go back to that and think on it, because at that point, I think Kim is known for a while and the evidence just keeps stacking up against Lauren. And um, I think I think Kim is going to work with them in some way, at least to divert to divert Herman's attention elsewhere, which may may prove to be helpful if and when Kieran finds fake fakes their deaths. Question. Do you guys think or sorry, do you guys think Will or sorry, do you guys think Dylan is alive? Because if we're talking about like Will's world kind of getting flipped over, I can see um Dylan, if Dylan is alive, that playing a part of it because I'd say that we are going to see some development between or knowing uh Will's relationship with Dylan, seeing how there was one panel with the two of them playing as kids. So it does kind of be like. I used to be very much against it. 
but now more on the fence. But if I really think about it, and I mean, there are other sides to this, but right now my immediate thought is that if Dylan's alive, what what is what has Lauren been fighting for aside from now that we found out that her parents were apostles? It takes away a very big chunk of Lauren's motives. And now it feels like she isn't less. I mean, sort of, because you know, if, if he was alive and involved with the PS, then there'd, there'd be a lot more stuff going on there. But it feel, I mean, Dylan's purpose in the plot is far from over. I mean, I always saw that as the point of bringing Dylan back, you remove you remove Lauren's motivation. That is, it's it's kind of weird to explain and hard to, but my idea was that. Lauren is going to have a moment of reckoning where if Dylan's back, she's really going to have to question, why is she doing this anymore? What is the point of this? And she's going to have to come to the conclusion that this is she's doing this because it is the right thing to do to stop the Phantom Scythe. And because when she started this off, it was a mix of wanting to do the right thing to prevent others from going through what she had gone through and it was also a bit of a revenge quest but um I think for Lauren to be successful she does have to realize that revenge isn't really the answer in this because you know revenge quests they don't really get you anywhere and she's going to have to go into the finale and go into the final season or you know at least the end of the final season being a better person and if you're if you want to be a better person you have to do things for others which means um not your not one of not your main motivation being because of a revenge quest a uh, selfish motive you I think you know, to, to live because... beyond something beyond one thing beyond something that happened mm-hmm. 10 years ago that she can't let go of I'm torn over whether I want Dylan to be alive because Lauren obviously hasn't let go of him yet. I, I, because if Dylan came back and Lauren was still mourning him and still grieving and still hadn't let go, it wouldn't really be that thematically sound because it would basically be like, don't let go. If you, if you like refuse to move on, then it'll come back to you. And I don't think that is a very good message to send, especially to a young audience, because that could be perceived in any matter of ways, like the first way I think of, because not everyone has, um, because it's not, you know, very common, thankfully, to have a dead childhood friend. The first place I would apply it to are relationships. Like, you know, you break up with someone and you want them to come back so much so, you know, if you're persistent enough, they'll eventually come back. And that's just not healthy at all in fact it's downright toxic a very good observation yeah i had a couple thoughts at the end of the episode um one was the author's note so it seems like it was the same cafe because it's a it's implied that he goes there often so oh. it seems like he brings a lot of women there maybe there was a bar earlier. There was a bar area that Karen was sitting at, I think, however, which is... It wasn't a bar, was it? I thought it was a bar. I don't know, some no. Mandela effect. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. I think but... it was just a regular cafe table. Oh, that makes sense. The Yeah, the author's note is, the witch just probably knows about Mr. Evans' shenanigans, but she never says anything because he's a regular customer and brings some good money. Yeah, that makes sense. It's probably the same bar. <laughs> I wasn't too sure. And then I next... think that he's single and just a serial dater, but... No. he is a white <laughs> by the way how, raise your hand if you think he's sus and he's like going to be crucial for the plot in some weird manner you can't see it but I'm raising I my hand know. right now <laughs> I don't know I want his wife to get with the lady who dumped him today like in that episode <laughs> you know <laughs> oh my god they should hatch wait not just his not just that lady all the women that he has dated have to get yes. together with the wife do some kind of major revenge plot, public humiliation. Ooh, this is gonna be good. Oh my god! If <laughs> oh the wife, liter- oh my god! If the wife literally got like all the girls Mr. Evan tried to date it, that would be beautiful because it would basically be the biggest middle finger to Mr. Evans, and he 
just be what? the baddest person on the block. A filler episode, a filler episode, not canon. Just one episode completely dedicated to that. Why not canon? That. Why not just make it actual canon? Make it an actual <laughs> arc. Why not? Why not? No. <laughs> a, side, a side comic dedicated to, to Mr. Evan, a rom-com. Mm-hmm. Or like oh a side God. comic dedicated to like the misadventures of the ladies of PH. So like we see all the, you know, best, <laughs> best characters be of PH. <laughs> so beautiful. They just, you know, go out and do things. Like, I don't know. I need a sleepover episode. <laughs> we may not get a beach episode ever, but a sleepover episode with like all the ladies and they're just gossiping. I, I need, I I need the Darcy sleepy. Kim friendship. I need it. Like I will die if we do not get it. I had something like this is pretty much like turning into another avenue here of mm-hmm. the topic, but um we, you, you mentioned something earlier, Flute, about um, revenge and Kieran wanting to take down the Phantom Scythe, but does he really want to take down the Phantom Scythe or does he just want to take down the leader? And will Lauren end up wanting to take down, I, I'm sure they want to take down the leader, but if they take over the Phantom Scythe, if that's an option, because I really feel like Lauren's going to get screwed over majorly. She's already been going through hell. And if they infiltrate, not even infiltrate, just go wage war against the Phantom Scythe and get rid of the leader in some way and decide to take over and make a change, I wonder if that would be, I wonder if that would be how it goes because it's not like Lauren's getting treated well by the police. It's not like people are telling her the truth. It's not, what else does she have? What options does she have to make change? And she's already, we've already seen that. Um, she's realizing the reality of so many people in Artelis that they're barely, they're struggling to barely get by. They're not educated. They turn to crime because they have no other choice. So give them a choice, give them something to fight for. Mm-hmm. definitely hoping for some kind of changing of the society at the end in whatever fashion I don't know how yet but I definitely want that to be like an end goal of the comic the story mm-hmm. I think it'd be really interesting to see how Lauren's character shifts from being very very goody goody to fault like goody like very good without um but while following her own compass she she's always been kind of gray while yeah she's been gray but she kind of tries to stay between certain lines at the same time which is what makes her very interesting and hypocritical i can definitely see a bit of a rebirth moment of another key part of the hero's journey and in that rebirth moment i would see lauren finally shedding the flaws not all the flaws because you know then she would be the Mary Sue but um, a lot of the flaws that plagued her over the series and uh, for new ones yeah <laughs> get rid of the get rid of the old to bring in the new that is some character building character development spring cleaning right there <laughs> I really um, just want to see Dark Lauren maybe Maybe, um, you know, if Lauren committed murder, that'd be pretty swag. <laughs> I'm kidding, but. She has been threatening to shoot someone for a long time now. I'm just going to put that out there. We're going to reach uh-huh. 100 chapters with no one shot in the head yet. Remember when Maybe it's Lauren. time. <laughs> Remember when we thought Lauren actually shot Sake? I was, I won't lie, it was a little sad when it turned out she didn't. He totally deserved it. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't. I didn't think she's the one who shot him, but mm-hmm. I remember people theorizing about that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No. Who shot him? I. That's okay. That's a whole other topic. <laughs> <laughs> so, do we have final thoughts on this episode? I have a final thought in that. I think you know the central conflict that we're ending off with is what is Will going to do and how is he going to react. 
because you know we know Will has this element of trying to live up to his parents, expect you know his dad's expectations, and he's also a little bit more like Herman in that he's a rule abounding person, and that must be very hard for him because Kim already we can see she's comfortable with the idea of Lauren being a loon and not you know revealing it when she asked him earlier you know what would you do if you found out it was someone you were close to, and Kim is more comfortable with living in the gray and understanding that morality can sometimes be outside of the rules so she's willing to give it to consider you know um not giving them in but will for will that will be a very big struggle and it's you know the question of loyalty to his friend versus loyalty to his dad and his personality of, of being a rule down person so that is something i'm very interested in seeing like what will he choose he has to get over his fear of punishment because mm -hmm. his strictness that he, it it the type of you know when a parent is so strict on their child that that even into adulthood they're following so closely to their parents' steps in their and that what they preach they have to dismantle that and that takes time. Mm -hmm. I I don't know how well it's gonna react. This is like old 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 material or like old theories like this is before episode 63 theories we were we thought that so like you know a long time ago <laughs> we thought that will was going to betray lauren when he found out that um that she was loon the theory that we had was kim was going to support loon while will was going to be more hesitant and there was, I remember someone even suggesting that Will was going to end Lauren in jail. Like he was going to, he would somehow get Lauren in jail and then Kim would break them out. Like uh, Lauren and Kieran. But honestly, I'm kind of surprised because I wasn't expecting this reveal to happen so quickly or this early on, but it makes sense because we are nearing the mid-season finale, so I shouldn't be surprised. Also, the question is, is um, she only deduced that Lauren was part of Loon. She doesn't, she said, she didn't even say Lauren is a member of Loon. She said Lauren is Loon, but they do know that it's two people. So I, I wonder Kim how fast Karen. they're going to figure out the identity of the second person. I think Kim suspects it's Karen as well, but the reason she's scared to say it's Kieran is because she knows one of the Loon members is Phantom Scythe and their husband. Because, you know, Loon wouldn't have the information it did if it wasn't for someone in the Phantom Scythe. So, that episode is going to be so good. Mm -hmm. So I think out of, like, just protection for Kieran and to, like, protect his identity, Kim is not going to be speculating on Kieran right now, but I think she does suspect him. But she's not going to be sharing that information with anyone. <laughs> She trusts Lauren to not be Phantom Scythe. She knows Lauren is not Phantom Scythe, especially after what the Phantom Scythe did to her. So yeah. Lauren, uh, Kim knows that the APD member of Loon is Lauren and the Phantom Scythe member is probably someone else. Like, you know, maybe Kieran. <laughs> Don't you think they're dating? I, I still think she thinks they're dating since she wasn't really lying about that. So I can't wait. <laughs> for the moment where Kim walks up to Lauren like puts her hands on her shoulders she takes Lauren is like and is like why are you dating the purple hyacinth because she still thinks that they're dating at that point <laughs> oh so if God, she figures out that, that, that he's so part funny. of Loom that still doesn't lead to him being the purple hyacinth so that's another the next the next step <laughs> oh boy well guys I think we have exhausted our discussions for this episode unless y'all have anything else um i don't think will is going i don't think will is going to be the betrayer at least i hope he isn't i, I think the possibility is open i'm He's not closing myself up completely he is more similar because like what hikate said i can see it apply to will and will stands please don't come for me i still love him as a character but i don't think he's fully grown out of his father's influence yet and his father and his parents approval is still something incredibly important to him and that will be a driving conflict 
And, you know, I would like it to see, I would love to watch our characters fail. And in the case for Will, failing would be um, turning on Lauren in this case. Because in episode 63, we did learn what uh, what Will would do, like, if he found out someone was Loon. And I think it was, like, he would have them go through the due process of the law and we sort of see a spectrum here um while we have we have the like strict stoic characters who are like death gets done by the law that would be will then we have march and then we have who kind of is like you know it's more a test of the situation and, and then we have kim they are i'd say they all are good people with like you know unless you know march is phantom aside then he's not as great a person but you know <laughs> the point still stands um these people all have their different ways of dealing with a situation like this i think march would approve of loon and what they're doing but um he would understand that it would be his job to you know persecute them because they are doing illegal stuff well kim would be just well kim would let them go free she would let them go free she understands that it's a matter of that can't judge stuff based on you know a few lines of text stuff has stuff does have to be judged as you know a matter of the situation but will would go you know straight to the court i guess so it's a spectrum of these characters if that makes any sense i'm not sure (laughs) No, I think it's great. I think, I think this is actually how the world is. So I find it's very realistic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. So I yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if Will has some conflict surrounding Loon. Oh, Wendy, I can't hear you. Yeah, I think that's going to be his central conflict. Mm-hmm. And, you know, maybe that's going to be the thing to push him to finally make a choice for himself and make a decision for himself and break free of his father's grasp. This could be a good inciting incident. If that's the choice. I'm, I'm very excited and I, or I do hope that we get this, but I would really love to see a Darcy and Will friendship because their situations are probably just, you know, so similar that I would kind of like to see them bond over their circumstance. And I don't want them to resent one another for, their situation because it's neither again it's not really their fault but I would like to see both of them help each other out instead of you know resenting one another so like Darcy helps Will break away from you know his father's expectations and Will also helps Darcy break out of her family's expectations of her as well I, I feel like Will is the kind of person that needs that doesn't make friends easily and like he needs a long long time before he lets people in his inner circle so I, I feel like that Darcy wouldn't be able to get in there so fast mm-hmm. but I totally hear the appeal yeah I think it'll take some time I can definitely see some conflict where they're bitter towards one another for quite quite a bit but I think at one point at, there's going to be at one point where one of them will just you know start to open up to the other and it's going to be like look if we're going to be stuck together, then we might as well try to, you know, at least like each other. Because again, as we were saying earlier, if you're going to spend a good portion of your life with someone, you're going to want to be friends with them. So I I would love to see them, you know, just both support each other in what they want to achieve and what their aspirations are. I see them being good friends after Mm -hmm. they realize that they both, they actually, they don't want the same thing. So they can really, once that barrier is gone, I feel like they can complement each other pretty well. Yeah, they would make such a badass team. Like, I don't, I don't ship them because, you know, Kiwi and Bella are safe for life. Mm-hmm. But I, I want, I want to see the relationship grow and develop. And I think that they have the potential for a super solid friendship right there. Yeah. And I, I think with the arcs that they're facing, they are gonna both be crucial in the other's arc like Darcy she rides horses and horses are a symbol of freedom I think Darcy is going to be a key player in encouraging Will to break out of his family's expectations because she under she 
understands what it is like to be placed under under those expectations and she understands the peril of Will's situation and she understands it to a level that other characters cannot because other characters have not faced what they are currently facing and so they they understand what the other is going through on a level that you know Kim and Lauren cannot because Kim and Lauren just haven't experienced this it's not to say Kim and Lauren are not important to the conflict as well. They are going to be crucial supporting characters. But I think when it comes to breaking out of this conflict or breaking out of this um, problem for, you know, Will, he's going to need the support of his friends. But I would also like to see the support of Darcy as well in it. Well said. I like that you said that they both have a similar understanding. Anywho, I think we can wrap this up. And thank you so, so much for coming on. This was- Thank you for having us. Yeah, yeah. thank you for having us. Awesome. I, I love these podcasts so much. They're so fun to do. <laughs> thank you. Whew, can't wait for next week as usual. Why is it not my Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> these weeks seem to be flying by, not gonna lie. Like, all around. Kind of, yeah. Like, I like blink. I blink and it's Sunday and suddenly pH is going to update tomorrow. And I'm like, how? When did this happen? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm going to see you earlier, but whatever. <laughs> for the next episode. <laughs> well, yeah, you. it's kind of late over there. You guys should go to bed. <laughs> I'm sorry for, for keeping you for quite a while. All right. Well, <laughs> Good night. I'll see you all later. Good night. Sleep well.